Bloom filters are one of those concepts that always confused me for the longest time in computer science. I'm gonna take a few minutes to actually explain it to you guys. And uh, not what are they, but why do they exist? So I'm gonna flip the question a little bit. If you're interested, stay tuned. So here is a problem, forget about Bloom filters. Here's a problem today that we know how to solve, but we can do it better. I'm going to write a service, a web service, Express, not JS, right? That essentially check if my username exists or not. And if you think about it a little bit, this, use, this, this capability, this feature is very simple to build, right? Build a database with all the usernames. As you start writing your usernames, if you want to build this interface, you make a git request, does Paul exist? You make a good request to the server, Express, Django, anything, and then you execute a query against your database, select a username from this table, hopefully you have an index there, and if the, if the record comes back, that means the username exists, if not, then it doesn't exist, right? Problem with this is very slow, right? And this feature is going to be very popular, right? All these users going to this web page and typing, hey, does test123 exist? Does whatever, right? Everybody wants a fancy nickname, right? So here's the problem, right? This is very slow. So what do we do? Well, I heard about this Redis thing, right? That is actually in memory database. So let's take it from disk and put it in Redis. Well, that's fine. We're well, gonna do the same thing, execute the same git request, but this time I'm gonna hit the database, right? And if it's not there, okay, I might sometimes need to go to the actual database because these two can get out of sync. So you created some inefficiency and you actually doubled your memory footprint because you're storing data here and storing data here just to solve this simple problem, okay? So you, we know how to solve this thing, but some smart people, computer science professors, came up with a solution, very efficient solution, and they called it Bloom filters. So let's explain what these things are, okay? So with Bloom filter, we're gonna use some in-memory representation. Usually it's very tiny. I'm using 64-bit in this case, okay? And this 64-bit magically have some numbers, right? In this case, the bit zero is not set, so it's zero, this is one, this is zero, 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 and this is one, right? So how does it come up? We'll come to that. But here's the thing. If we're gonna make a request, hey, does, you, does Paul exist? We will make a request to the server, and in the server, we'll write a function. We will hash the string Paul and mod it 64. And if you know mod, what will happen is this result will only come back with a result from 0 to 63, right? And just like that, out of the box, you're going to get collision all the time. But that's fine. So in this case, Paul is bit number three, right? And we, if we go ahead and check in my integer, in my 64-bit integer, this is the filter that we built. Does this bit exist? Is it set? No. If it's not set, then you can absolutely, with 100% guarantee, say that Paul does not exist in the database because it's not set here. And we're going to show how that, uh, that happened. Okay, so Paul doesn't exist. So I didn't have to even query the database. Let's take another example, right? Where I'm going to check if Jack exists. I'm going to make a git request to the server and I'm going to mod that string Jack. I wish, first of all, we're going to hash the string Jack, get a bunch of big number, right? And then mod 64, I'm going to get a value from 0 and 63. It happened to be 63. I check the bit of 63. Oh, it's set. And if it's set, here's the thing. If it's if that bit is set, that means Jack may be there. And why is maybe? Maybe because 
there might be another string that matched hash and mod 64 that resulted in 63 and was set not necessarily jack himself right but some other string that matched it but that is actually enough for us if it's set then well it's set i'm gonna take the hit and hit the database so i kind of saved myself some queries at the database is this perfect no but it's a very efficient thing to actually query right to to prevent unnecessary querying by the way cassandra uses this in their uh, implementation of uh, consistent hashing all the time right the 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 ss tables and all that stuff they use this internally right because anything anytime you want to avoid an expensive query to check if something exists or not or or if you want to do a this query but you're not sure if you're going to get a result or not blue filters are very useful this there are some disadvantages to this but let's look at actually how to create a bloom filter i have a brand spanking new bit set here 64 bit right and i'm gonna create user jack for the first time it's a it's a blank database right there is nothing in it i'm gonna create jack so if i'm gonna create jack i am going obviously to make a post request to the server to the express server and i'm gonna hash jack mod 64 i am going to get 63 in this case and what do you do before writing to the database the username jack is you set this bit nice at ease isn't it and then you obviously write it to the database so see this is how we start building this in memory representation of bloom bloom filter right and then let's try paul hey i'm gonna create a user paul poof post paul right mod 64 what do we get oh bit three let's set bit number three all right so far so far it's good let's try and and obviously we write it to the database Let's try some other user, Tim. Well, I'm gonna take Tim and hash it, mod 64. Guess what? I got number 63 again. And that's absolutely perfect. That's okay because you're gonna get, you only have 63 bit, 64 bits. Obviously, all the strings and names in the war, you will fill, fill between these things, right? And uh, obviously, when you say 63, it's already set, so you don't have to even bother yourself setting it because it's already set. But you always have to head the database and write it, all right? So that's how, how it's actually made. Let's take another user, Ali, all right? So Ali, uh, hash Ali and get six, mode 64, you're going to get bit number four in this case, and you're going to set that bit, all right? And then obviously write the database. All right, guys, so that's essentially Bloom Filter in a nutshell. I know the actual implementation of Bloom filters are a little bit fancier. They use like three locations and all that stuff, right? Sometimes they have they have more bits, right? They use three hash functions just to make the odds harder to get, right? But and that's that's just to me that's just an implementation. But if you if you understand how it works, that's how it works, and that's why it exists, right? So some limitation of Bloom filter, you can get into a case where all of these puppies become one 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 one, and in this case, you will your Bloom filter is essentially useless. You you became the first case where you're always gonna hit the database. It's not really harmful. It's not gonna there. It's not gonna slow you down but it's not going to give you any benefit per se right so you're going to have to think about this like the bigger you make this thing right then you kind of interfere with your memory footprint but i mean it depends how big it is right really but the shorter it is then you're going to get all these false positive cases where you're going to always hit the database regardless right all right guys that's it for me today Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome.